Joshua Smith here, and welcome to the GSD Mode Podcast. Now get shit done and smash that subscribe button now. What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode Podcast interview every single week. I interview top entrepreneurs, top real estate professionals, and those that are straight up just out there dominating their space. These are people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves and their families. And today, you guys got another badass guest on the show. This dude is just uh, tearing it up, man, doing some some cool things, some interesting things, some unique things, especially from the real estate agent team leader space, which we'll talk about. Um, uh, But our our guest today is the CEO and owner of the DeVoe Group. Uh, He's got uh, real, real estate teams in nine different markets, and they specialize in servicing buyers, sellers, investors, and landlords. And one of the things that really uh, differentiates his teams for, from a lot of other real estate teams in this business, you know, most team leaders are racking up agents to go out there and, and serve them, you know, right? I'm not saying that they're not serving their agents, but they're, they're making revenue, bringing revenue in um, and trying to, to grow their production where, where Dave's process is, is kind of the opposite. You know, it sounds kind of funky when you first think about it or hear it, um, but his goal is to get his agents to stop selling. And but what that what I mean by that is he's a, a, a large investor himself um, and their model is uh, uh, through teaching their agents how to go out there and grow and expand and, and make commissions, how to take those commissions, invest into their own real estate and build their own real estate portfolio so they become financially free to the point where they don't have to sell real estate. Or if they sell real estate, it's because they choose to sell real estate. So he's trying to create independent wealth for his agents through investing in real estate, which I love because not only is he, their their team selling real estate, they're also investing and buying the product that they're selling, you know, right? Which shows that they believe in it, which is again, unique model and I love it. I'm excited to hear more about it. So stoked and honored to have my friend, Dave, go on the show, show my friend. Thanks so much, man. I am so excited to be on this. I mean, I've been a big fan of you learned so much from what you're doing. So I am honored and humbled and excited to be on here with you. Yeah, no, it means a lot, man. I'm stoked to have you here, dude. So um, before we get into what you're doing today, man, because you're, you're just on fire, you know, right? Um, uh, you are growing, you're expanding, you're getting ready to even come into to my backyard, right? Um, which is dope, dude. So, uh, but before we get into what you're doing today, man, I'm always intrigued in our guest journey that led him here in the first place. So if you want the clocks, man, like what, what led you into entrepreneurship and what led you into real estate in the first place? Um, I, I was always geared towards entrepreneurship. I think it came from my grandfather and my father, who were both entrepreneurs. I learned so much from both of them at, at such a young age with just little little things that they, they would say that I would pick up on and ask, you know, something as simple as my grandfather would, he'd be eating a peach. And then I'd be like, hey, Pop, what are you doing? Eating a peach? And he's like, yeah, you want half? And he always would teach me about in business how, you know, really – looking to help people and being coming from actually coming from contribution was so important to building a long-term business. So um, it started at a very young age and uh, you know, I sold knives. I, you know, I sold mortgages. I did everything. Uh, I was, I never really had a job, um, job, job, you know, I was always entrepreneurial and my approach. So uh, I was in the, I was a lender from about 1999 until 2009. And um, I, I built up that business pretty quick. I ended up actually running some of the branches of the mortgage company. And uh, in, in 2009, in my market, mortgages literally disappeared for like six months. You know, So what I was doing for a living was, was gone. I would write loans and we, we couldn't close those loans because we would get to the closing table and they're like, well, that bank doesn't exist anymore. Um, you know, uh, I'm sure you remember that, that time. So my game plan was to build the business and, and kind of withstand what was happening in the mortgage world. And my approach was in Hoboken, New Jersey, which is my market. I had just opened up a branch of the mortgage company and I was networking with uh, real estate companies and I planned on getting my license to get even further ingrained and to build relationships there to service the mortgage business. So um, I ended up at this uh, company, this local company, and, you know, the owner of the company is like, yes, come in. You'll be our guy. All of our mortgages are going to go to you. Um, you'll be our in-house lender. Uh, just go get your license, uh, real estate license at the same time. So I got my license. Then I quickly figured out that that company did not sell any homes at all. Um, they were just a rental factory cranking out rentals, and they were really good at it. Um, so I figured out this system. I developed the system for doing these rentals. And 
in our market, you know, you rent a property for two, three thousand dollars, a two bedroom condo, and you make half of the month's rent as your commission. So you can make a living doing it. And uh, I, I ended up cranking out, you know, 15, 16 rentals a month for several months and was was making a lot of money. Before that, I had no money. I burned through all my savings in those six months where I wasn't writing loans and I was young. Um, so I didn't exactly, I wasn't investing and you know, I, I didn't, I wasn't doing the right things with my money as I was making it at such a young age, right? Um, so what happened was at, at some point I had somebody who was renting who I converted over to buying and they bought a condo. I made 11 grand and at the time I was working like 13 hours a day hustling these rentals and I made, you know, in one sale what I could make doing 10, 12 rentals. So I was like, you know, peace, like this is what I'm going to do. Like I'm going to sell. Um, so I got into sales. I, I you know, I found a, a dude in my market that was the top agent. He was selling like 60, 70 homes a year at the time, which I, I couldn't really wrap my head around. I, was, I had some limiting beliefs there, but I did anything I had to do to get in front of him. And he kind of road mapped out what he was doing. He said, I'll tell you everything that I do because I know you're never going to do it. So I'll just tell you. <laughs> and for anybody who knows me, you, you can't really say that to me because that's going to light it up. Um, he was following the MFO system, like ferry system. And so I went balls to the wall, just went in, crushed the phones every day. I did exactly what they were telling me to do. And uh, that's how I ended up in full-time real estate building uh, my business. And, and, you know, we'll probably go into the rest from there, but that's basically how it started. It was me in a broom closet, headset on, Mojo had just come out. So I had a dialer and I, and I was just cranking for four hours a day, every day. Um, without missing a, a beat and without missing a day. Yeah. No, I love it, man. It's, 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 it's funny how sometimes, you know, it feels like our world can just be imploding and, and falling apart and, and, uh, you know, doors close, but then, you know, another one opens and then it can lead to so much greatness, you know, and, and, you know, being that I got licensed in 2005. So I went through the, the boom and the bust too. And, and it was a scary times, you know, but, um, you know, you've got that, that sign behind you that says grit, you know, right. And, and Angela Duckworth, I don't know if you've seen her TED talk, you know, right. But she talks about, she wrote a book on grit and she's like, grit, grit is, is, um, you know, running a marathon, not a sprint, you know, right. And, and you're a dude that definitely stuck with it. You didn't abandon it. Yeah. You had to pivot from loan originator to, to the real estate side from rentals to jumping in the sales, but I love it, dude. So, so what, what time was this, man? Was this like 2010, 2011 by the time you jumped into real estate full time? Yeah, it was 2010. Um, it, was, it was 2010 when I, you know, it just so happened that as soon as I decided I was going to do this, there was this, um, this retreat from the Mike, Work, Mike Ferry organization and I went there. And then from there, it was just literally at that time, it was go on Craigslist and print out all the for sale by owners and I had a stack of them. I had scripts. I had no idea what I was doing, but I just called them and was just read them the script at that point. And um, I, I just... Like you said before, I, I'm somebody who always just, I'm, you just get out of the way. I'm just going to go. It's going to be a mess and I'm just going to go because I see so many people who were doing this and it was working. So I understood that it was going to be painful. It was going to be a lot of work, but I just did it. So this was, yeah, like around 2010, um, my first year, you know, 2009 and like my first six months of doing sales, I sold like three homes. 2010, I really worked hard. Um, the whole entire year and I did about 13 uh, transactions and then it kind of grew. It, it seemed to have doubled every year from there um, up until now uh, as I grew and I kept building the database and eventually got into a space where I, I built a team. But, you know, along the way, as you're going into the office to make these calls that are not necessarily going to put money in your pocket right now is hard, you know, and especially walking to the office, seeing, these people that are going to their real jobs where they know they're getting a paycheck and I don't know, it could be nauseating. And um, my, my thought then was if I can find a team that I can join that has all of these systems in place, I could do so much more. Um, and, and that was one of the first thoughts I had as I started building this business and seeing how much goes into actually servicing um, I wasn't doing, you know, I was doing 13 deals, so I could definitely handle that. But my vision was 
50 deals the next year. And I couldn't handle that. So I, I was searching for a team that could do what, what I would want as an agent. Um, and I didn't find it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, again, another blessing, right? Cause it, you know, you can't, you can't find what you want. You go out there and create your own, you know, right. So, you know, quick question with this though, man. Um, you know, I know the, the, the rental thing kind of accidentally led to, to jumping in real estate. It wasn't planned. It wasn't intentional, but reflecting back on this, because you know, we have such a high failure rate, especially in the first couple of years that real estate agents jump into the game. Um, because it is tough, man. It's tough to go through that, you know, first six, seven months without a paycheck or whatever it may be for most. You know, do you, but doing as many rentals as you did, you know, do you think that that was number one, a good foundation um, uh, to really prep you for being in the field, working with clients, finding out their wants, their needs. Yeah. It's a rental, not a sale, but a lot of the process is the same, you know, right. Sometimes rentals can be as hard as a sale or harder. Right. Um, and then from there with the supplemental income, you know, I talked to, I had another podcast last week with a dude that uh, was on here and he did like a thousand BPOs in his first, it was during the market crash. But in his first, you know, couple of years of real estate, just his supplemental income, and it, it, he he didn't know it at the time, but it just made him an expert at valuations, which really fast forward his trajectory. So sometimes, you know, those things just set that foundation. So, you know, what what kind of an impact do you think that that had that allowed you to jump into thirteen deals your first year, which is you know most agents are doing one their first year. Um, and then two, is that something that you'd recommend a lot of agents to start? Cause there's an abundance of rentals and a lot of, like in my market, dude, like nobody wants to work with them. I mean, they, they, they anybody can have them. I what 1000% think that it should be the first step because a lot of agents get to that, you know, they go into real estate and they don't sit down with somebody and actually look at the financial picture of what is going to happen over the next four to six months without a paycheck. Where is that going to leave you? They, they don't actually look at that logistically. And so three, four, five months down the road, they're not operating from a place of abundance. They're not operating from an optimal standpoint because they're, they're getting crushed financially. And success could be right around the corner if they're, in, if they're in the right scenario and they have the skills and the work ethic, but they don't make it because they didn't prepare. So I think doing rentals now in... Our market, it's like I said before, when you do a rental, you get half a month's rent. So if it's a $3,000 rental, you make 1500 bucks on it. It's a decent commission. Um, the average agent in our market is selling eight homes a year. So if you can figure out the system or plug into a system where you can build these rentals, and we have a few really good systems, it does a few things. Number one, it gets you cash to pay the bills while you focus on building your sales business. And you know this as well as I is that when agents are making money, they're happier, they're less stressed, they operate better, they operate from a less slimy position and it's easier for them to put the customer first instead of just from a scarcity mode trying to do whatever they can to make some money. So the rentals will provide that bridge. I think more importantly, the amount of business that I, I've done from all of those rentals I did just in those six months, I've had repeat clients that where I've made, you know, Twenty, thirty thousand dollars in commissions over the year because I did a rental with them back in the day, and even more importantly, we look at rental listings as passive income. If you are able to use some of our systems to target and get in front of the right landlords and list their property for rent, it's passive income because it's going to happen every year until inevitably they either sell or most of the time they're just going to continue renting. And so, if they're a true landlord investor that got into this rental because they actually wanted to make money versus somebody who just maybe rented it because they couldn't get the price they needed at that time. Either one of them is an opportunity. So I've got four or five rentals that just happen every single month. My team manages them. I don't have to do anything. It's passive income. Um, and then also just from the standpoint of we're, our business is building a database of people that buy and sell real estate, landlords buy and sell real estate. So we have a really good opportunity to help educate them, and what we do with our, our investors is we're not just sending them listings and stuff or trying to find them off market deals or whatever. We actually sit down and do a consultation with them and walk them through our goal setting workshop to figure out what do they want to do in their business and how can we help them grow their business as an investor. Um, so there's a lot of different things you could get from doing that. And I 1000% recommend unless somehow you're walking in the door with a big project or, you know, a lot of listings that you 
figure out the right system for your market and, and do rentals. Yeah, no, I, I love it, dude. And, and what's so cool about it is, let's just say it's a new agent. They, they may be intimidated to go sit down and talk one-on-one with an investor and, and be able to, to, they may lack the confidence to be like, hey, I'm the agent for you when they don't have a lot of experience. But when you're working on the, with, the, with the tenant side at first, you, you naturally get to know the market. You get to know what, what's popular with tenants, but then you also get to know, you know, what works from the landlord side. Um, you know, it, it's like, look, you want to become a great listing agent, become a great buyer's agent first, right? Like you get to know what buyers want, you know, what's in demand. You're more in the trenches of the overall process. You just learn a lot more, you know? Yeah. So um, yeah, dude, hundred percent love it. So then when you talk about the passive income, um, because I know that, uh, you, you guys service a lot of, a lot of rentals in, in addition to investing yourself. And I, and I think that's the case, right? I don't know if you have a property management division or, but is that, is it just the listing each year when they get a new tenant and getting the commission from that, or are you servicing the property management side all the way through? We're not yet. Um, we're looking at every aspect of a real estate transaction and figuring out how we can service and build a business around it so that you have these kind of a la carte. Uh, services, ancillary services that you could provide that are just part of a real estate transaction that's happening that you're a part of anyway. Um, and property management is something that we are definitely going to be getting into. We just have a lot of other things that are way more important right now that we're, we're building. So from a, a, a place of, of passive income, um, we're looking, you know, we have a few different divisions. We have a wholesale division uh, that is finding wholesale properties and either we're buying them um, and giving our agents um, and the agents that are in our downline or on our team opportunity to invest or use their commission as an equity piece in that property. Um, and then, you know, if it's not a wholesale, if the seller is looking to get the most money that they possibly can, it's getting referred over to our, um, our retail team and they're servicing the listing. Uh, we're also, you know, our agents are always looking for properties for us to invest in following that same model where they could invest a minimum of uh, 10 grand and have an equity piece in a, in a small project or a, maybe a big project and have the opportunity to roll that profit back into another investment. Um, so those are a couple of the ways that we have some holds, we have some flips. Um, we have the opportunity with the brokerage that we're with to have a massive opportunity for passive income just by providing uh, an opportunity for agents to train and grow and coach with us. Um, and then also we have our, our Airbnb company that uh, I built two months ago that it plugs into this whole rental thing. Um, I'm sure we'll probably get into it a little bit later, but those are just some of the areas that we're all looking to build together. A lot of times agents won't be able to invest $10,000 in, in a big successful project, right? Because the developers don't need that. Um, so when we're the developers or we're working with developers, we give our agents a, a starting point to invest in and to start to grow that. That's what we're all about. Like you said in the beginning, I want to recruit agents, get them into high level production so that they never have to be in production again, whether that means leveraging out their team and their business or just plugging into the investment side of, of what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Cause then too, it's, it's, you know, so many people have the approach of what am I going to get out of this? If I invest 10 grand, what I'm getting, you know, financially what I'm getting back, you know, right. But the real power is, you know, the skill sets that you gain and the person that you become from the experience, you know, right. So you're allowing them to get that real life experience uh, that becomes such a huge asset down the line. So, but going back to after your first full year where you, you know, 2010 or whatever, where you did the 13 deals. You, know, you mentioned that you're just banging out the, the phones, cold calling four hours a day, calling Fizbo's, but that, that's something that's hard to scale, you know, right. I mean, at four hours a day, Thir you know, to do 13 deals, you know, plus you get to a point where you got to service these clients, plus you got to keep consistent with your calls. It's, it, it can be a tough model to, to scale and delegate. And, you know, um, uh, what happened next, man? Cause I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see if, if, was it your sphere of influence that really started, you were able to tap into that started to play or was it a different approach? You know, what allowed you to go from those 13 deals at four hours cold calling a day to scaling to the point where you could grow your team? Um, so the next year, it was pretty simple. Um, I, I started thinking about ways to be prospecting outside the box. And what had happened was you have expires that are happening every day, right? And everybody's calling them. I mean, you know, my market, you're competing with like 25 really good agents in a city that is one square mile. 
and has 50,000 people in it. So yeah, you're going to get listings if you're consistent with it and with your follow-up. Um, around 2011, 2012, what I noticed was the market started to go up pretty quickly here. And um, I just did a kind of an analysis of the people who were expiring in 07 to 2010, 2011. And I looked at their prices that they were listed for. And then I did CMAs on a bunch of them and they could get that price now and they could get even more. Um, so I started prospecting expires from, and withdrawals from four years ago. And, uh, you know, the approach was, hey, you know, I noticed the hydro on the market, gosh, back in 2008. And I know for whatever reason it didn't sell. Um, if there was an offer that was acceptable to you on your home, would you consider getting it on the market and getting it sold? So that question is really hard to say no to because I'm saying if there was an offer that was acceptable to you, would you do this? Um, and a lot of times it was just, yeah, what's, what would the offer be? And I'm in conversation with them. And, and a lot of them were, were landlords that they had to move out. You know, our, our, this is a condo market, like 90% condos. And they had their second, third kid, or even their first kid, and they're moving out to the burbs. Um, which we could talk a little bit later how that played into our expansion. But uh, a lot of times they couldn't afford to sell it in 2010, 2009. So they rented it out and they were not making, they weren't cash flow positive. They were just breaking even, sometimes losing a little bit. But, you know, the next question is did you rent this to earn cash flow and to actually as an investment or did you just rent it and to kind of hold the place until the market got to a place where you could actually sell it and be profitable or just get out of it? And most of the time, that was the answer. So let's get together. We, we, you know, and, and that whole next two, two and a half years, that was my main source of, of listings were, were those, those people that were in that position that expired, you know, four or five years ago. Yeah, that's so brilliant. You, it's, you know, I mean, so many agents you talked about, man, that, that get a list of expires today. Yeah, right. I mean, people are on, on you know, unplugging their phone line because they've got the 30 calls by noon or whatever, right? Um, but I, I don't know the exact statistic of, of what it is today, but last time I checked, and this was maybe a year ago or so, it was like 90% don't list in the first three to four months. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's a long-term game, but the longer that you go back, the less saturated it is. So many people are the one and done. So you have less competition with those, but then, I mean, really at the end of the day, sales is all pain and pleasure, identifying what their pain points are and what the pleasure is that they want to go and just articulate into them right? That you're the best guide to facilitate the process. And you were able to really tap into this. And I'm, I'm guessing that some of this was because of your expertise now in the rental market, you could speak to them and you dealt with so many landlords and, and were able to know those pain points. Yeah. You know, right. But the questions that yeah. you were asking was able to identify you very quickly, identify for you what they want, what their pleasure was. And then from there, it's just connecting the dots. It's not, it's not fancy scripts, right? It really is just pain and pleasure, understanding what the hell people want and show them that there's options that exist. That's a really important point. I think even in today's market, I think in sales and in business in general is a lot of people skip over that is what do they want? And when you focus on that and, and there are scripts that could help you uncover what it is that they, they want. I studied NLP for three years straight to, to perfect those conversations, but you don't need to do that. You just have to genuinely want to know what they want. And at the end of the day, what they want is not tied to money. It's not tied to a transaction. It is tied to a feeling. And if you can ask them questions that unpeel that onion and get to, all right, well, what is the feeling that is going to, that, that you're going to experience when you're moved to Florida? Or what is the feeling uh, that you're going to experience when you don't have to do this, this, and this with the house, whatever their motivation is. And you, t you tap into that feeling. What happens is trust goes up, resistance goes down and a byproduct of that is that business gets done most of the time but we skip over that we just ask them the general questions without really digging into what do you want what is this and not only what do you want what does it mean to you what is it going to feel like when x y and z get done and when they tell you that and the, the end of the day the answer is usually freedom or happiness it's so much easier for us to just say wow freedom i mean isn't that a great feeling all we need to do is sign the contract in order to get you X, Y, and Z. So it's really important um, to, to make sure that you are not only asking those questions, but you actually care, you know, and you want to know. Yeah. And then, you know, the second component to that is now that, now that you know what they want, right. Then from there, you've got to be able to articulate 
that what they want can be accomplished and that you're the best, you know, the best guide, if you will, give them confidence that you're the person to, to be able to help them go from A to Z. Um, but to do that, you gotta, you gotta know your market, you know, and, and man, it's, it's crazy how many agents just don't know their own backyard. Um, you know, can you kind of elaborate and speak to, uh, uh, the, the knowledge base of getting to know your market and the power that that's been able to have on you? Cause like you said, okay, Hey, they're selling here and wanting to move to the burbs. Yeah, right. We got to know the condos and you got to know, you know, the suburbs and what that can look like, what that transition is. And, and maybe too, having your loan background, that might be able to help with your ability to speak at a higher level for, Hey, we can take this equity. Here's what your payments might look like and, and, and be able to do that. But the fact that you can do that sounds like it's led to a hell of a lot of success for you. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm going to say this, um, and, and I mean, this as just a general statement is for the last six years, you, agents didn't have to know their market. I mean, it was so easy. You put the property on the market at any price for, for the most part in a lot of markets and it was going to sell, right? If you did know your market, you were gonna, you were gonna excel and you were gonna, going to um, earn more referrals and more business, but it, it, it was easier. Now it's not, you have to know your market inside and out because there are things happening that are just weird. And if you can't figure out why it is that they're happening or why it is that they're not selling, you know, you have to be able to not only articulate that to them, but you have to know what to do. And if you don't know the market, how are you going to know what to do? So to your other point of like, you know, this is how the expansion happened for us is all of my sellers, I was working primarily with the sellers and then hired some buyer's agents to uh, handle the buyer business. And our sellers were moving from Hudson County, which is, you know, Hoboken, right across the river from Manhattan, they were selling here and most of them were moving to suburbs that were anywhere from 20 to 40 miles or even less from Hoboken. Um, and these are markets that I knew I grew up in one of them and did mortgage, mortgage business in one of them, but I didn't know it like the back of my hand and I wasn't going to go out and work with them to help them buy this home when I didn't know the market. And at the same time I was building something here and I wasn't going to at that time go take the time to build the knowledge that I need in order to service them the best way possible, right? So that's where expansion came into play because we were just referring them out to other agents, which is fine, right? You get 25% referral, you don't have to do anything. You, like, hopefully you chose a good referral agent and the client gets taken care of, but essentially we were then losing them um, to that client, you know, I mean, to that agent. So that agent now had them in their book of business and they were the expert in that market that was gonna get all the referrals. Um, which again, is fine, but I wanted to figure out how to be able to build an operation and a system and then have teams in those areas that could service those buyers that were already going there. And then also we were going to help them build their business. And that's kind of was the, the whole reason why we started doing expansion and why we did it so quickly and were successful quickly because we had the clientele that were moving into those areas already to build off of, right? Yeah. Well, what's so dope about this? I mean, so many people, because the, the, over the years, man, you know, when I first got in real estate, dude, teams really didn't exist. Nobody heard about them that, you know, uh, um, uh, but then over the years, man, it's become this, you know, sexy thing. Everybody wants a team and they create it out of want, not out of necessity, right? Like you created it out of demand, you created it out of necessity. You were losing money. Um, if you, if you didn't expand, but I do love that you started referring it out. Yeah. You, you might lose those future clients, you know, right. Um, but it does give you a chance to test the demand to see if it's worth, because even if the agents, they're focusing on the client, I mean, there's still a lot of focus and energy and effort on your part of hiring the right agent, training them, inspecting what you expect and all of that. So, you know, it sounds like because you did it organically allowed you to grow really smart with your team. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing really. I mean, it, you know, it was like this, you wake up one day and you're like, do I know what I'm doing? Um, and then the next day you wake up and you're like, I think I know what I'm doing. Then the next day you wake up and you're like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and then, you know, through all of these mistakes and I had a, the, the great um, advantage of really um, networking and talking to agents who've done what I wanted to do and learning from the mistakes that, that they've made. Um, and then I still made them. And so, you know, the, the, we had the advantage of, yeah, we had a real reason to expand. We weren't just looking to expand to grow. You know, growth was causing us to expand. Um, and at the same time, what we were doing 
you know, to service a hundred transactions, it's not that you just do more of that to service 200 transactions. It becomes a totally different animal, especially virtually with expansion. Uh, um, and we learned very quickly. I was very lucky and I am still very lucky and fortunate to be able to attract people um, into my organization that get this. The whole time I was building it, there were many people, you know, my coaches, um, just, you know, peers, other people, mentors that were telling me to do it a different way. I wanted to do it the way I did it because I knew that if I found and I built a culture um, of this kind of almost family-like atmosphere for these agents that it was going to be something that grew and people were going to want to be a part of it. We still had minimum standards. We still, they still had to perform and we still had to perform. But you're not getting into our world if, you, if our culture doesn't serve you. If we can't help you because there is a mismatch on any level, we're not going to get into business. Um, so that kind of slowed me down a little bit, um, learning that. But when I look at it today, I love these people. And, and I learn from them. And we all learn from each other. And we are collaborating. We are all here to help each other. It's like sometimes it's like a, a we're, we're like a – psychiatrists you know like it's just amazing and then on top of that which we could talk about as well building the right systems to know that we could build a duplicatable business now anywhere that we want in the country as long as the talent shows up and is there yeah yeah i mean my my you know one of the biggest hardest lessons i had to learn which are you know on this this journey of success we learn we have so many of those but it was like you know i i was arrogant in the thought of oh man, I'm a great realtor. I could sell a ton of homes thinking that that would allow me to be a good team leader and had nothing to do with it. Right. It had every, you know, it was, it was my ability of being a great entrepreneur and a great leader that allowed me to be a great team leader, you know, nothing to do with the opposite. And it was a tough lesson to learn. And, and a lot of that came down to the systems that you're talking about, tracking your numbers, knowing, knowing your data inside now, inspecting what you expect, having the right systems for every aspect of your business. So, as you were growing and building this, what were some of those, you know, early on lessons that were tough lessons to learn, but then allowed you to go start to scale it uh, as fast as you have? Well, you mentioned this on another podcast a couple of times. I heard you mention this is that there, there's a distinct difference between leadership and just being a good agent. It's very rare that you find somebody who can do both. It's almost impossible to do both. And the hard the difficult part about that is somebody who's a really true leader, they're going to come into that position and it's going to take time for them, just like a brand new agent would to earn the income from the production, from the growth. So you end up having these top producers um, who have enough leadership qualities to be able to put them in that position to grow and leverage out their production so that they could focus just on leadership. Um, and I think my, one of my early mistakes was just that, just what you said, just thinking that, all right, well, here's me. Um, I think I'm a good leader and I, I, I did X, Y, and Z in production. Now I look at this guy or this girl and they did the same thing. So they're automatically going to be a good leader. Then you put them in a position and they end up failing. And, and the agents that are part of that team also end up failing because you, you didn't look at the leadership portion of it first and foremost. Um, you just wanted the production to carry it through. Right? So, there were a couple of different ways that we we fixed that. Number one was really having a solid leadership, coaching, and training um, foundation that was a part of the company that can train the the leaders out in the fields the right way to be able to grow their teams. I think that was something that we missed early on was the focus on honing in and building our leadership's qualities of leadership and building them as leaders because we were just focused on deals, deals, production, all this stuff, you know, to, to generate the revenue. Um, when you go from being in production to growing a team, it's a totally different world and you're going to lose money. You're, you know, I could, I don't mean this in like an arrogant way or anything, but it's just true that I could go and sell 80 homes a year with a couple of assistants and maybe a showing specialist and make more money than I'm making building this team for the last three years. I chose not to do that because I'm fulfilled by impact. And I'm aware that this group, 
the DeVoe group that I've grown, that we're still growing and building together, served a number of different purposes and is continuing to serve a number of different purposes. One of those is the fact that I'm on this podcast with you, right? The fact that I get the opportunity to talk with some of the top agents in the world because we have production numbers that you know, enable me to do that, to get into those rooms, to build the downline that we're able to build and to create this passive income um, that we're able to create, right? And the second thing is, look, if, the, if this company didn't make any money, I would still do it because I love the opportunity of building impact. We do make money, um, but I like the opportunity of building something big because there are other businesses that are gonna grow off of that. The agents are gonna grow passive income. They're gonna grow um, their, their investment portfolios and their, and their revenue share. And also I've got people that I love that are really talented in my operations team that have a great job, right? So as we scale, as we grow, as we continue to exponentially grow this team, we're gonna to continue to make money. The most important thing to me is the impact that the culture and the company has on the people who decide to plug into it and be a part of it. Yeah, love it, dude. So then, you know, you, you mentioned something earlier where you said, you know, you're lucky to attract great people. And, you know, the, the harder you work, the luckier you get, right? Um, and a lot of that is when, when you talk about attraction, because I, I hear so many great leaders talk about, oh, I, I, I attract great people. But the, rea- I mean, it, it's that internal deep work of your own personal pursuit of constantly leveling up that inspires people just by being in your presence, right? Because of the, the internal self work and the growth that you're personally going through um, inspires them. It's, it's uh, one of my coaches always says, you know, she's like in management, people always say, um, Oh, I got I can lead a horse to water, but I can't force him to drink. And then she's like, have you ever tried to pull a horse that doesn't want to be pulled? Like you're not going to win that battle as a leader. Your number one job is to make that horse thirsty. Right, because if you make that horse thirsty, they'll be begging you to lead them to the water, and then once you get there, they'll drink the shit out of it. Right, and <laughs> how you make them thirsty is by being the example. So, with that being said, and, and you know, you're a guy that does so much self work, right? That then, and like people are just inspired to be around you, and that's why they're attracted to you're able to attract talent because they, you know, greatness attracts greatness. Can you kind of talk about that of over the years of doing this? Because people see, oh, I'm doing the four hours of dials a day. I'm selling all these homes but they also don't see what's happening, you know, um, um, after 8 p.m. It's, it's, like, it's like, you know, greatness is made after 8 p.m. What happens after 8 p.m. and before 8 a.m., you know, right? Of all those off hours when eyeballs aren't on us, you know, what, what self-work, what, what does that look like? What does your, your self-work look like over the years? And what does it look like today to continue to expand and grow your own personal self? I think it's this thought of just awareness. And um, th- this is something that I've practiced. I was coached on. Um, I always have had at least three coaches and two of those coaches were focused on mindset at all times. And earlier on in my career, I was lucky enough to um, work with a guy named Aaron Novello who coached me um, on the systems from this book called Taming Your Gremlin. Taming Your Gremlin. And this is a roadmap to be able to live in the moment. And you hear that phrase so many times. And I think that I was lucky to be able to learn from people who actually experience this because there's a difference between believing something and experiencing it. Happiness to me, living in the moment to me is a skill and it is a practice. It's not something that you're going to one day figure out and you're going to be happy for the rest of your life. You have to work on it. You have to create it and you have to constantly be working on it. Um, and so for, you know, I follow that practice. And, it, and if you think about it, it's basically awareness when you become aware of where your your kind of focus is is it in your mind is it in your body in the form of meditation breathing yoga or is it out into your environment meaning the people that you're connecting with or just really focusing on nature it cannot really be in two of those places at the same time so the process is the awareness where am i Am I in my mind? Am I in my body? Or am I in the environment? And when you call that awareness, immediately the chatter usually shuts off because 95% of the time we are in our head having a conversation like a mental patient with ourself about horror movies that are not necessarily ever going to happen, but we're worried about it. We're worried about the past. We're worried about the future. 
we're not in the present moment. So when you call that awareness, what happens is now you've got options. And with options, it comes the need for flexibility. You have to be flexible to, ab to be able to work on these different options. So awareness, flexibility, and options lead to power. And this is something that I've learned from my coaches, Matthew Ferry, Aaron Novello, that you can actually be in the present moment by following this process, understanding where it is that you are, and then figuring out where it is that you want to be. Do you want to be connected to the outside? Uh, or do you want to be connected to the inside? Um, or sometimes it makes sense to stay in your mind if you're working something out. But usually, if you're in your mind for more than 10 minutes, you're ruminating, you're worrying, and nothing productive is going to get done, at least in my experience. So that is the process that I follow on almost an hourly basis. It's my goal is how many minutes can I string together today where I am truly connected to the environment, to whether that's people, my wife, my family, and it can't be without them in the world of mind and I'm just kind of paying attention to them. When I'm truly connected to them, I have a feeling that takes over that nothing else can replicate, nothing else can beat. It's that connection that I'm, that I'm always working towards. And, and most of the time, it may only be a couple minutes out of an hour that I get it but I'm appreciative of it, appreciative of it. And, I, and, I, and I can live in that gratitude because you know, everything else might make it easier for me to get there, a closing, a really high profit month, all that stuff can make it easier for me to be happy. But I've, I have the tools, I have the control to be able to, to do that no matter what's happening around me. Yeah, and, and when you talk about the, the, the power of being in the now, you know, I, I, not just your personal life and your overall fulfillment, but then in your, your success with your clients, with your agents, you know, in today's world, man, because everybody's so distracted, you know, their, their eyes are down here. You, you go out to dinner and you look at everybody's eyeballs, man, and friends that haven't seen each other forever, they're fucking posting about on social media, not being in that moment, you know, right? And it's, when you ask people, it's like, when's the last time other than maybe like your mom or something, you know, right? But somebody else gave you five minutes of 100% zero distracted time, devoted time, looking you at the eyeballs and made you feel like you were the only person that existed. Like it's, it's very hard to think of that, you know, right? But when you give that to clients or you give that to somebody, it makes them, you know, it goes back to how to win friends and influence people, right? It just makes them feel good. It makes them feel important. It makes them feel special. So even on the client relationship side, man, um, whether now for you, clients aren't just buyers and sellers. They're also agents as you're, as you're growing and recruiting. But yeah. it's, man, it, it, it's, it's so ungodly powerful. And, and with that being said, you mentioned the book, um, um, Taming Your Gremlin. Is there any other you know, books that you've read on this or, or, you know, documentaries that you've watched or any other recommendations, you know, cause this is such an important skill set that I think all of us need to be more intentional nowadays than ever. Cause it's easier to get distracted than it's ever been to yeah. flex this muscle and build this up. Um, yeah, there are a couple of books. I, I just want to touch on what you said before, cause I think it's really important is the thought of that having that five minutes of undistracted real connection. A lot of times, this is my experience, is because we're in this world where we constantly have to be doing something, our attention is on our phone most of the time, um, we tend to give up and just say, I, I can, you know, I'm going to go in here because this is where I'm comfortable. And they don't, they don't get that five minutes. I think a really important key for me was to just be okay with that, to just be okay with it. It's 2019. We live in our phones. We have the opportunity to get enjoyment out of all of this stuff. And that's okay. Let me just schedule five minutes out of the day where I'm going to connect with somebody and put it in my schedule and just start there with just five minutes. Journal about it. See how it goes. And then go back to all the other shit and just be in whatever, you know, social media or whatever you're, whatever you're doing. But I think being okay with it is, is key, was key for me to be able to then form those connections. Um, so Taming Your Gremlin and another book that had a, a profound um, – change for me was the go-giver um, and there are some really cool examples of exactly what we're speaking about and not only for connection and for personal growth and mindset but for business you said it before is that when somebody knows that you are listening and you've got their undivided attention and you're listening to them they feel heard like they feel like they've they, they've been hurt. 
And I got really good at doing this with clients through my NLP training, through just these books and everything. Um, and I was not very good at it at home. And when I read this book, I was like, wow, I, you know, I'm always trying to solve problems. <laughs> Most of the time, my wife and, um, you know, a lot of the people in my, my world, they just want me to listen. And I'm cutting them off going, boom, got the answer to this, 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 and that. But the whole point for them was like to just speak and to just be heard. And that's so much more valuable. And that book kind of gives some really good examples around that. Um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, huge one. You know, uh, Think or Grow Rich, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yeah, it was a big so then, um, you know, one thing, and I think we, we actually, this was a side conversation we had before we hit the record button, but uh, you, you talked about, um, having pretty strict uh, requirements for somebody to join your your team, yeah, right. And, and all that means is, look, man, you're you're looking for committed people that that want to go out there and that, that are. I, I have a mentor of mine that talks about true believers. You know, right? You got employees, you got teammates, and then you have the true believers that believe in the cause, that are fully committed, that are all in. Um, yeah. And one thing I hear constantly from team leaders is. You know, the whole, man, it's so hard to identify talent, so hard to recruit the, you know, the right people in the organization. Um, can you just speak to this a little bit of, uh, about what you do through this process and how you identify those true believers? Because it sounds like you, you do such a brilliant job at this. Yeah, I, th- I think so. Um, and it's reflected in the fact that I see it happening every day. I, I, like I said before, there's a difference between belief and knowledge. And the difference is that knowledge comes from experience. So I experience it every day. And people told me that people always tell me that I, I do too much. I do too much for my team. I do too much just in general. Um, we've got a call every single day. It's called Revive. And it's at 11 o'clock. It was designed, it's a mindset call. And it was designed for, look, these agents are going and they're doing their lead generation in the morning for two, three hours, however long they're doing it. This is a way for us to unwind, talk about mindset, um, you know, just really to move them powerfully into the day. Sometimes you could be pretty beat down after the, after that, right? And we did it. We The idea was to do it for three months while we were doing this 90 listings in 90 days, which was really 270 listings in 90 days because we had three teams doing it. Um, and then afterward, everybody said, we can't stop. Like, we have to keep doing this. And it's been a few years of doing it every day. I leave this call probably 80% of the time, and my leaders leave the call this every day at 11. And the people who are true talent to me show up, they get it, they contribute to it. And that's kind of the, the foundation that we do have a process that we follow. And if we do identify talent or if somebody comes to us and wants to be a part of our organization, but it's not because you're, you're not good enough to get into our thing. It's that I want to make sure that our thing resonates with you because if it doesn't, and if, a lot of the core values that we have in the culture that we have doesn't resonate with you. It goes over your head or it just is not something that you connect with. I cannot help you. And, and everything else, the tools, the systems, the admin, the marketing, the lead gen, you're going to get that too. But, it, but the real core of it is about personal growth. Um, and, and I've seen people have, have come and gone on my team that they, they didn't connect with that part of it. And, and for me, that's the, the most essential thing. So I don't remember the question exactly, but um, did I answer it? Yeah, I mean, it's just just about identifying, you know, the the true believers um, and I, attracting, oh, yeah. hiring, recruiting, um, and not just. And it sounds like the revive call is not just recruiting because it's easy to get them, you know, people excited up front. But after a year of this, how, you know, how do you, you're always having to resell them to, to constantly buy back into the system, right? Yeah. You know, just like with our past clients, just because we do a transaction with them, any of our stats, you know, show up and prove it. 88% of buyers and sellers said they love their agent, would use them again. And only 11% do a repeat transaction. And it's not because they, in their mind, they felt their agent did a sheer job. It's because they lose contact. You always got to be reselling them. You know, it's our job to, to teach and train them to do business with us, right? So, um, um, same thing goes with the team. So, it sounds like the Revive is a great way to not just get their, their mindset right, but when they see that and you leading 80% of them, they see your commitment to them, which is huge, you know, right? Um, but then when it comes to identifying, like if you're looking to recruit a new agent to your organization, you right. know, like what, what does that process look like? Cool. I, so, up until now, right, we have not recruited. Um, we've got 50 plus agents on our team, um, the DeVoe Group team, and we've not 
We have not started recruiting yet. We're going to, um, but we have not. It's all been either the, that people have seen what we're doing, uh, it, whether it's in the office or online, and they want to be a part of it. They were invited as a guest into one of our mindset calls, and they want to be a part of it. Most of the time, that's what's happening. They're, they're, they're showing up to us based on our consistency and putting our story out there and just letting people know what we're about. I think social media has helped a lot with that, with us just being raw and honest and humble and saying, look, this is what we're doing. Come check it out. And people check it out and then they don't want to, they, they want to be a part of it. So we're attracting the people who are seeing some of the crazy sh shit that we're doing or some of the fun things that we're doing. And they're showing up halfway there because we know if you saw that, or if you came to our workshop, and your eyes lit up when I said this, I already know that you're, you're, you're probably gonna resonate. And then we walk them through the, the rest of the process. So attracting them, and one of the big things too, man, is um, you know we have this appointment academy, which has been a, a blast and is just taking off. It's a five day workshop where, you know, Monday through Friday, eight to four, uh, these agents come in the room with us and we're actually training them for an hour. Then we get on the phones and we're live coaching them, whispering to them, hey, say this or, you know, do this or whatever it is. Then we debrief, then we train, then we get back on the phone and, and we do this for five days. Within those five days, there, I come in and do my goal setting and mindset workshop. I do my NLP objection handling workshop. And the last day we give them a peek under the hood of our systems and what it actually looks like to be a part of our team. So they're spending five days with us. We're getting to know who they are and how, how gritty they are powering through these five days, they get to hear our story and see what it's about and feel the energy. And just naturally after that, they're either gonna be like, cool, that was a great piece, or they're gonna be like, I, I wanna you know, I, I want to be uh, more of a part of this. What we've done in the past few months is my director of growth, his name is Seiku Pyle, just the best dude, like just an amazing leader, coach and trainer. He trained me and he recruited and trained me when I first got into real estate. Um, and I'm so lucky to, to have him. So what he's been doing, what we've been doing is every Wednesday from four to seven Eastern, um, we have a mini appointment Academy and it's kind of morphed into, it's, it's called 2k Wednesdays. First it was 1k Wednesday. Now it's 2k Wednesdays, meaning for those three hours, there are a bunch of people here at our hub, right? People are hanging out. Our lenders are sponsoring it. There's food. There might be wine, beer, whatever. People are just ha having fun doing lead generation together. Then we opened it up on a Zoom call and a Facebook Live, and we're getting crazy, crazy amounts of views. Last week was the first week we went for 2K Wednesdays, which means 2,000 contacts in three hours. We, last time numbers are reported, we hit 4,000 contacts um, in, that, in that session, that three-hour session. And with the five-day full appointment academy, which we're going to be bringing around the country, the last time we did it, it was 20 agents. They generated over $3 million in potential GCI from the appointments that they set just in those five days. So now, that's and I think if I read that correctly, it wasn't $3 million total. It was $3 million average each. What I'm saying is three million in GCI total. Oh, 20 agents. okay. So yeah, that three million, not in volume, but in GCI commission yeah. that they've generated, that the, potentially generated from the appointments that were set based on the average price point, based on the listings that they they took. We don't have the la uh, you know we have the lead indicators. We don't have all the data as to how many of those closed, but we're working on getting that. But you can see, you set three million dollars worth of GCI in appointments. Even if you're brutal, like 20% of that is going to convert for, for those agents. And it's, it's been fun, man. Today is another one. Um, they're setting up for a four, four to seven, 2K Wednesdays, uh, which is probably going to be called 4K Wednesdays now. That's awesome, dude. So, you know, you said, you said that you guys don't recruit, but, you know, a lot of people think of recruiting is, is just like, cold calling prospecting physicals are expired. So well, you're, you're recruiting, but you're doing it through marketing, right? Like I, I got a buddy of mine that, um, you know, has a great YouTube channel. He's out of Portland, Oregon. And you know, he's, he's, he's bringing about 5 million a week of business um, in, in gross sales volume, not commissions, um, uh, just through the YouTube channel. You know, right? Now, these are people reaching out to him from the YouTube channel, but he's intentional with marketing. Like you're intentional about putting on these events, showcasing what you guys are doing and, and marketing that to the public where they can see it 
where they're coming in. So, you know, you're, you're, you're recruiting, but just in a, a and, and dude, look, at the end of the day, when you look at true professional businesses, they don't chase, they attract. And that's exactly what you're doing. Totally, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Then we are, we are recruiting. We just are really intentional about doing it from a place of bringing actual tangible value, right? When we do a lunch and learn, or we do a mastermind call, or we do, or the first thing we make sure is we're going to bring some actual tangible value for you to grow your business. We're just going to put you in a room and show you a video and be like, do you want to join? Like, we want to make sure that we're bringing value to the marketplace. And as a byproduct of that, yes, we are recruiting um, from a marketing and a passive standpoint. It's not, we're not calling, like ripping the phones, trying to, trying to recruit yet. Um, but it's more fun that way, for sure. Yeah, love it, dude. So, you know, I, I don't know exactly when, but it's, you know, decently in the, the recent past uh, that you made the transition to EXP. And, you know, it, it, you talked a lot about passive income. And I know that you personally have, what, close to 60, you know, rental properties yourself. And you're, you're a guy that's looking to build future wealth in this passive income. So I'm guessing that the revenue share that could come in from it, plus the ability to be able to, to allow that for your agents, you know, but it sounds like through a lot of these events that you do, you know, cause it, it, like when I do events or, or whatever, all people that w- will come to us and there's some people that want to join the team, but then there's, you know, people that are like, Hey man, like, I love everything about this and would love to be mentored by you, but I want to create my own team. And as a team leader, not a broker owner, that becomes frustrating because you don't have a place where you can do that. But EXP allows you to, Hey, regardless of where you're at, or if you have an agent on your team that grows and creates their own team and wants to leave your team, you still have the ability to continue to mentor them um, and, and get paid on those fruits residually over time. I mean, is, is it a combination of those efforts that, that uh, made you make that, that transition to EXP? Because especially when you get as big as you are, it's not easy to switch either, you know, right? That's a big move. So you got to be really certain that it's the right move for you. So can you just kind of elaborate on, on what's led you to that, what led you to that move? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, it was my my team and my agents, and, and I wanted them in the best place possible, both um, from a growth perspective and from a financial perspective, um, because we're providing a ton of value for them from, from the team standpoint, from the DeVoe group, um, and yet they're still having to pay, their, their net of what they're taking home was, was okay, but it wasn't for a place where they could really start to grow and plug into these investments. So that was the first and foremost, the training, um, you know, the, the systems and the tools, all of that stuff had to work. It had to be the best possible opportunity for them before I even looked at the other things that ended up being way, way more impactful. Um, so yeah, the, the, the revenue share opportunity with the XP, I never thought it was going to do what it's doing. I never thought I was going to have this much fun in helping people build their business. And these are people who are direct competitors of mine in my market, as well as people who are all over the country. You know, we launched our Orlando team because of the move uh, and and they're they're loving it. Uh, We have people from all over the country, hundreds of people that in just four months, we we have the opportunity to collaborate with, right? So it's a different dynamic with with a team. You're kind of responsible for them. And it, it becomes difficult, like you said before, to make sure that you've provided a path for growth where they could be as big as they want to be. So you've got to be so big so that they can be as big as they want to be. Um, so it's a different dynamic when you now have a revenue share model that pays, that creates a financial alignment with these agents such that I'll do anything for them. I will do anything to help them build their team, you know, to help their agents, to train their agents. We're all kind of working on this thing together with really powerful agents all around the country, you know, people like Dan Beer and Kyle Whistle and Jay Kinder, um, who now we're all on the same team. And it's a massive team. And the intention behind that is truly to help each other um, and, and, and have a big impact. Uh, it's, been, it's been amazing, man. And I still love the DeVoe group and I will still continue to grow that group. And because of how this whole thing has unfolded with the the stock and the revenue share and because of how much opportunity to collaborate and make money, there's a strong possibility that those two things kind of meld into each other. And the way that I look at teams now has changed because I, I had the opportunity now to, to help this other team that I like these dudes and I like these girls. I've always 
like them, they're in my market, you know, we're all friends and everything, but I would never give them my system, right? We're, com- we're competition. It's different now. You, what's, what's mine is yours. And I, and I think that's the biggest part of this company is that we're all growing this together. Um, and it, it really has been so much fun. The most fun I've had in a long time. Yeah. Yeah, no, I love it. Yeah, I was having a good conversation or a conversation with a good buddy of mine. Um, it's a, a mega team leader. He was with KW before. He was, you know, ex- he had an expansion team in six different states, you know, do it. And he's, his main hub is out here in Phoenix and there's a lot of production, you know, right? And we're talking about this transition to EXP. And I was breaking down the numbers, you know, right? Of, of you know, the cost differential and, and, you know, the big thing that he talked about that made the transition because as a team leader, it wasn't necessarily... Um, it may have even been, you know, costing them more money or, or maybe been a break even point. Right. But the ability to, you know, he said something that was pretty powerful. He was like, look, I've never had the ability before to, to be able to create an environment that allowed my agents to go out there and, and, you know, create this passive income and, you know, create ancillary wealth or because most team leaders, like when you have a, maybe a JV and a title company or JV with a lender and you know, all these other ancillaries, you know, typically that that's to supplement the low margins of the team where, where, you know, you get, it gets to the point where you can't share it. So um, uh, where this was, you know, the, the first vehicle that he'd found where he could, was able to do that. And his agents now are able to, to develop that passive income. And like you said, take that stress off of, of, of the transaction, transaction, the commission breath, you know, that, that can happen when you're stressed of like, dude, if this deal doesn't close, shit, how am I going to pay my mortgage? You know, right? So it's definitely yeah. a dope tool, man. Um, and, and the experience. We see it too. Like, you know, there's people, the way that we did this, like I, it was not about me. It was about how many people could I impact. And I, I see, um, you know, a woman in, in my downline whose life is changed because now there is a huge team under her. Um, and, and, you know, we, we helped make that happen. We all help each other, um, to, to make this thing happen. So it's, yeah, just like you said, it, it takes the stress out of it. It makes it more fun. It's always better to be able to lean on people, whether they're in your market or not, that are, that are solid, that have either been through it and, you know, just being able to help the single agents who don't know where to turn or, and don't have somebody at their office that has a plan is, is going to hold them accountable and really push them. And now they have that just been cool yeah love it dude so uh for those that want to follow you learn more about you uh maybe they want to get in touch with you and have a conversation about uh, uh you know what this could look like with exp or, or joining your team um uh and, and then in addition to that you know it sounds like you put a lot of this out there you stream a lot of this content out there maybe it's on social media business page or whatever where any of our listeners can learn from what you guys are doing like what, what are the best places to go do that at so um my instagram is is homes by devoe um and it's d-e-v-o-e so i put a lot of good content out there um i think if you find me on facebook david devoe you'll find the link today for the mini appointment academy that happens every wednesday and then you can or you just go to the appointment academy uh facebook page and and uh join there um like i said before I, i always have to be adding value tangible value and I'm willing to spend as much time as I need in order to do that. So if anybody here wants a free 30-minute coaching call, strategy call, mindset call, whatever it is, um, I will do that for you. And uh, you can sign up for that by going to elevatedominate.com. Awesome. So you just go to www.elevatedominate.com. You could sign up for that. We'll, we'll reach out. We'll wrap for a half hour. And, and if nothing else, you know, we'll, we'll have some fun. Yeah, love it. And to whoever you're watching or listening to this, to make it easy, and I guess we'll have links to all of that below. Um, did social media handles, all his websites, that link that he just mentioned, all of those will be below. So check those out. Wherever you're watching or listening, uh, those will be there. So one last question for you. I know we're going long on time. Um, but knowing everything you know now today, if you could go the, the day right now in this moment could go back to when you, your, your younger self, when you first started your career, whether it's mortgage business or, or the real estate business, you can pick and choose. Uh, but give yourself two pieces of advice. You feel what to just tr- fast forward to your trajectory of success that you're on. What would those two pieces of advice look like? First um, I would find a team uh, and I would, you know, it, it, it wasn't, you know, like you said, teams weren't what they are now back then. Um, but if it's now, I would find a team to align with. 
And I would search out the people who are doing what you want to do at a high level and do whatever you have to do to get in front of them to, to learn from them. Right. So those are two things I would do. I'll, I'll, if I could add a third, um, what, I, what I would say is just be okay with, with things as they are and lay out your goals in a way that you know you're going to be able to achieve that. Don't go crazy and say, I'm going to sell 200 homes in my first year, which you interview people a lot who do that. You know, it's possible, right? Be intentional about your goals and tie back into what we said before around why are they your goals? What is the feeling that you're going to have when you obtain those goals? And instead of doing a dream board of all material things, do also a dream board about the feelings that you're going to experience when you get to those goals and keep them in front of you as much as possible. Cause that emotion, that feeling is what is going to drive you to do some of the things that you might be uncomfortable doing. Yeah. Love it. Powerful stuff. And those that are watching and listening, I know I end every podcast with this, but information without implementation is truly the start of delusion. Information is no longer power, but it's taking action on that information that you learn that allows you to create the power in your life that gives you the ability to go out there and create the life that you know you want and deserve. And Dave shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you today. Make sure that you take something that you learned, go out there, take massive action on it. So again, you can go out there and create the life that you know you want and deserve. And again, below in the, the show notes will be all the links uh, uh, to, to connect with Dave that he dropped here on uh, the interview. Thank you guys for watching and listening. And Dave, man, I truly appreciate you taking time to be here, man. This has been a lot of fun, a huge honor. I appreciate you taking time out of busy day to do this, dude. Likewise, man. Thank you very much. It's been fun. Yeah, 100% my man. All right, you guys. We'll see you next time. Peace. Peace. Hope you enjoyed this GSD Mode podcast episode. Now make sure you get shit done and smash that subscribe button now.